Thanks everybody, thanks for uh, coming here. Um, I was kind of half expecting it to look like uh, the room was about five minutes ago, which is you know, not half as many people. So, um, uh, welcome everybody, and well, yeah. So, welcome to my presentation, uh, Continuous Everything, or the Analytics and the Speed of Development. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about, uh, well, let's say my experiences as a as someone who's kind of stumbling in the uh, profession of software development and uh, IT in general. So take it as a, as a kind of a, not really a war story, not really a case story, just as a, as a bit of a, uh, a bit of a telling of uh, what I kind of see happening around uh, the world in Europe and in America and in Finland and uh, here, here, in the, here in Latvia um, about this kind of phenomenon. So, you may be wondering who the hell is this guy and why, why is he doing with the Britney Spears microphone? So, um, my name was on the last slide, Ilka Durunen, it's a Finnish name. Um, though today I am based in London, uh, in the UK, because I felt like it wasn't cold enough in my flat in Finland, so I moved to, moved to the UK where they have no insulation whatsoever. I've literally been sweating here all the time. Uh, but, uh, so today I work as a solutions architect uh, in a company called Sonatype. Um, and Sonatype, well I'll t tell you a little bit more about what I do today, but um, um, previously in my career I, I've done kind of a many different roles. I've been uh, the big data guy at a, at a big Amazon consultancy called CloudReach. And in fact, um, when I was working for CloudReach, I came here to Latvia to um, uh, do a talk in uh, Labcraft which is, if you haven't been to the meetups and you're based here, you should really go. They were really good speeches. Well, partially because I was there, of course. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, at CloudReach, I dealt with um, uh, big data architecture and architecting um, systems for uh, data analytics. And for most specifically for um, uh, data scientists to use as, as, you know, the system where they fetch all of their information and build their models. So I'm not an analyst myself, I'm more of a software engineer. Previously to that I worked as a, as a researcher slash, I, I like to call myself product owner instead of researcher because that sounds a lot better. Um, but um, I, I, I was dealing with uh, cloud computing and um, uh, uh, DevOps and, and the kind of lean methodologies and how they fit together. And around the same time I also had my own startup. I don't have it anymore, but um, it was a good experience. And I was the uh, techie guy. If you want to tweet me, you can tweet me. But um, today I'm I'm under I'm here under no badge specifically, and I'm here just to kind of give you guys a talk about about yeah like I uh, well, like I said earlier, what I see is happening in the um, kind of uh, uh, software industry and, and the IT ecosystem in general. Um, and so the disclaimer is the conclusions that you see here reflect mostly my personal opinions. So. Um, uh, you know, blame me, don't blame the names over there. That's, that's pretty much it. So, if you're wondering what kind of buzzwords and what, what kind of background I'm kind of coming into this talk, um, I've been working with these technologies most recently in the last few years. So, as you can see, there's a, there's a little bit of Hadoop and Presto, which are both um, uh, uh, big data systems in the sense that Hadoop, you probably are, are probably sick of hearing by now. Uh, Half the people understand it, half of the people don't, but it's everywhere. It's been everywhere for the last seven years or so. Uh, Presto is a SQL database type of analytic system that you can plug on top of uh, HDFS. We'll talk a little bit more about you know how that works. Uh, but yes, so I've been dealing with Amazon Web Services um, and uh, programming language-wise, mostly in Java, uh, Python, and uh, R out of all languages, uh, which is a statistical analysis language, probably. Many of you people here know. I don't know what the composition composition between developer and analyst here is, so um, I've just kind of made this in a, into a middle uh, presentation of, of kind of both worlds. But finally, um, on the right hand side here, uh, today I deal more with um, issues around DevOps, around how teams develop their software, and it's specifically my company, Sonatype. It runs the Maven Central Repository, which is a which is a large library of uh, binary artifacts that's mostly found in the Java world, especially the enterprise world. So I think some of you guys may have heard of it. So, um, so um, nowadays I deal more around the um, kind of DevOpsy side of things about 
how to get teams talking more uh, to themselves, how to make you know, the whole process of developing applications and software a little bit better. And now, well, the analyst side of me, or the um, kind of uh, person that uh, did the big data stuff, uh, enjoys that side as well, because this is a visualization of the Maven Central Repository, which houses um, uh, about 1.1 million um, uh, binary artifacts, or so JAR files, that you can use as, uh, uh, as dependencies for your uh, Java applications. And this chart illustrates, it's kind of pixelated here, but it illustrates the dependencies that the uh, components have upon themselves. So, so um, and, you know, as you can see, it's, it's quite complex and quite, uh, quite a big mess, which uh, I'm still waiting for that database access to uh, run some queries, but um, I'm sure my boss will give it to me someday. But the thing is, um, uh, so I haven't like, done hands-on architecture for about uh, a few months now, uh, specifically to big, uh, uh, big data and, and, and those kinds of environments. So when the guys at the Eternity called me, they were like, can you come, can you come and do a presentation over, over at our uh, conference? I was like, hmm, well, what kind of talk do you want? Well, you did, you did a really nice talk around big data last time, so how about that? So I was like, well... I'm not like uh, hands-on at this point, so what, what could I talk about? Well, I kept thinking about it, and, uh, and this was a big problem for me, like, hmm, what, what should I really tell you guys about, and, and should, you know, should I just say no? And the first thing I started doing was, well, can I find a connection point between big data and DevOps as a phenomenon? Could I, can I find anything that overlaps? Because if I really think about, you know, uh, data analytics and, and those sorts of things. Generally speaking, I tend to think them, think of them as two completely separate. Well, you know, software is software, and you know, analytics is analytics. They come from two different motivations, and they don't really overlap. But I did what any good any good ex university person does when when they try and structure their thoughts. I created a mind map, which looks very very bad uh, in this uh, slide over here and it doesn't even fit it, fit it all so this is just the tip of the iceberg it kind of goes along, down pretty much to the floor uh, with just kind of things that are dependent on each other and that r relate to one another um, in the field of um, in these two fields so the first thing that I kind of came back was um, was um, as, a, as a developer uh, my, my kind of roots do lie in software development and, and writing software, um, uh, has been that the general understanding of my, of personally myself uh, about the kind of business analysts and the data analysts working for my company, creating models, has always been this, it's kind of that furry little guy that lives under a bridge, doesn't really interact with anyone. Every once in a while, they'll kind of climb out of their cave and they'll come back and say, oh, I need this table to be appended. And then you're like, oh God. That's, uh, that's unplanned work, doing data migrations again. Oh, now I need to, oh, you can't overwrite that table because there's something, something wrong. And then, you know, once they get what they want, they kind of go back into the game, and the only sound you hear after that is kind of like, ooh, and they, you know, munch at their data uh, very happily and, uh, you know, work on their whatever models that they work on. And, um, well, obviously, this is not correct, and, uh, uh, and uh, so on. But, I then started thinking, okay, well, how does, how does that process work? If, if it's not a guy under the bridge gnawing on bones that you toss at them, how, how does this process work? This is obviously a very, very um, simplified version of the truth. But nowadays, nowadays, you know, we could, we could look at that process, that uh, what happens on the bridge in, in three simple steps. First of all, we've got some source systems that provide data uh, for you know the database that the uh, analyst works on, there's some sort of magic black box of ETL. Not necessarily always a black box, but certainly in an enterprise context, in in, in certain companies, uh, looks very much uh, very opaque, and you don't really understand what's happening in there. And then finally, you have some sort of data warehouse uh, that um, that um, houses a normalized version of the truth that comes from these disconnected systems. This is probably what a lot of data, uh, data um, sets look like in your companies. Certainly in my consulting career, most of the time when I went to companies, this, this is pretty much the version of the truth. So there's, there's disconnected databases that have their own unique schemas, 
They're, they are silos that contain and were just designed for their own uh, purposes. Um, these silos have their own schemas, have their own upgrade paths, you know, and it doesn't really matter matter to these steps whether or not whether or not um, you know what happens at the later stages. Now, let's envision a operator's normal scenario. A update happens here, you know, the schema gets updated, whatever. Um, the ETL process, which is shorthand for extract, transform, and load, does a couple of things. First of all, it plugs some data out of the uh, silo system perhaps most of the systems, normalizes it in some way, so transforms it, perhaps enriches it a little bit, you know, adds, adds like in the machine learning presentation we saw today, um, adds some information like week days and things like this, and then loads it into this massive big data warehouse. Well, first of all, if you change the schema here and you try, you know, you've had your own migration problems in the first place, transforming data from one level to another, um, it can have cascading effects on, on the later steps. So for example, the ETL process often has to change because it relies on knowing the schema that, that is at source. If you have 10 databases here, you know, you pretty much have 10 different processes to load things up. And then finally, you know, if something changes here, loading it into here might take a long time. Or if you added some information into here, the schema itself in here has to change. And these are all massive, massive problems. So okay, there are some bottlenecks in this process. And then you know, uh, generally speaking, I, I kind of, uh, kind of um, generalized and said information in silos, mysterious script, and you know, do not touch because once you get things into here, it's hands off, and uh, you know, it will run uh, from here until eternity until it works better. From an information perspective, it's quite a simple task though. You know, you've got some source tables, they get transformed, then you know, you get these the right tables that combine often information around different points of view into one. From an analyst's point of view, um, uh, this process looks like this. So you know, you've got some source tables, and they are uh, exported through this mysterious process. Um, and more often than not, uh, some kind of analysis happens of it. So. That's just a, represent a German representation of a whole app cube. But, you know, an analyst will sit down, create their models, and, um, and um, you know, transform the data. And a, a certain use case often is, is the business wants some reports out of this source data that happens within, within the um, uh, organization in those silos to kind of, you know, get a report out of, um, out of um, what, what goes on in their enterprise. And more often than not, this this thing happens in Excel. And again, uh, as, as we move forward as a company or as we move forward as an industry, the amount of source tables just keeps, it keeps increasing. It doesn't necessarily even have to be tables, can be files, can be whatever. And um, normal tools start not being able to cut it. I mean, Excel was a really, really good tool 10 years ago. It still is for many things. But for doing something like business metrics and dashboards, not so much. Um, and um, uh, well, yeah, I've seen an enterprise about 7,000 people relying entirely on Excel as, a, as their way of reporting uh, business metrics. Not so good, but not all the time. So the business then takes these, uh, takes these uh, reports or whatever, whatever outcomes, and they try and project dashboards uh, out of those to kind of, uh, kind of predict and understand what the situation of the business is at this moment or how fast the business is moving and growing. Well, in this case, we can see that the business uh, is not only run out of fuel, doesn't run at all, and doesn't move forward at all. So in this case, for uh, the business, uh, the person uh, either gets a wrong dashboard or gets a dashboard that doesn't really have much relevant information to them. And finally, then, the business owners will take that dashboard and then allegedly make the right decisions at the right time about the business to kind of steer it into, into a better direction. So in this case, if the employer satisfaction doubled from 1% to 2% because of their policy of firing smart people. So yeah, uh, so that's one bottleneck, of course, then in, in this whole process. The value of the data, the understanding and the right interpretation of the data. So we have some problems and of course, you know, um, we could keep talking about, you know, what are the, what are the, um, uh, problems in this space. So for example, 
Um, and if we look at the data warehouse schema, this is a this is a simplified uh, simplified version of what is known as a data vault schema. Some of you may be familiar with it, or everybody's familiar with it, and you know I'm just preaching to the crowd. Um, but the data vault schema is basically a kind of combination between star patterns and third, uh, third degree uh, normalization uh, patterns in, in databases. And um, uh, this is how some data warehouses look like nowadays. Um, it's a really good solution to a problem in the relational space because, because what it allows you to do is basically split the information into hubs and have you know, your normal relationship tables that kind of uh, break those uh, relationships down, but then still have uh, fact tables and satellite tables that contain you know, the actual information. So this is kind of a solution to, to um, pretty much a data schema problem, because loading and, and appending schemas in databases has traditionally been very hard. You know, if, if the source information changes, you know, doing that migration can take a long time. So, but still, that doesn't mean it's the best kind of solution out there because, because this kind of model uh, tends to be really hard to read from. So, you know, if you're like me, not a, not, you don't write SQL every single day, to get some kind of uh, coherent information out of a schema like this, obviously this is very simplified, uh, but if it was a real one, it will have, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of different rows. To get uh, valuable data out of this would mean probably I've seen seven degree joints, you know, just So, unless you know you do it every single day, it can be very hard to leverage the information written in there. And still, even appending one bit of information into this will require you to, you know, create a whole other chunk of tables, you know, load people things up, and uh, that then creates stress in, for example, ETL and extraction and transform and load. Um, then, of course, uh, from an operational point of view, we have my favorite type of action, which is sharding. So, sharding, as, as we may or may not know, is, is uh, spreading information across multiple different databases. So, in, a, in the traditional relationship, uh, relational database systems, this is how you would scale out a, a database cluster. So, you have, you know, shard A, shard B, shard C, and you have some kind of proxy in front that kind of keeps track of where does each set of data live. So, for example, uh, customer tenant 1 lives in shard A, uh, tenants 1 to 54 in shard A. Uh, from 55, they start living in shard B, and, and so on and so on. But there has to be something that kind of keeps track of this information. And if you've uh, ever been involved in the operations side of things, this also is a pain to manage. And this is a pain to manage, pain to, um, pain to keep track of. And, you know, if one of these shards go down, then, you know, you've effectively lost the subset of your data again. It can be quite hard. And then finally, uh, to my favorite point, uh, point of contact, which is the extract, transform, and load process itself, which is very, very hard to scale. So this is a screenshot from a, a fairly well-known uh, ETL product. I'm not going to name it because I'm not here to slag on anyone. But um, basically, ETL, as I see it done in the enterprise, has mostly been done with these kind of graphical tools. At first, it makes sense, you know, I need to do complex operations for databases. For example, load some information from the master database, maybe adjust it a little bit, then map it out to some other data from other databases, and then go row by row, perhaps to uh, enrich the data into some kind of thing, and then, you know, write it down and, and evaluate and uh, make sure that, you know, everything's okay. The problem is, the problem is uh, that it looks great at first glance, you know, you can read it, but um, scaling this out will mean that you will do hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of recursive operations like this. And also, if you ever use this specific tool, clicking on one of these will open up a menu that makes uh, uh, 1995 Visual Studio look really, really usable. So, all of these things in, in, traditional, uh, in traditional kind of data analytics has worked to, um, uh, to make it very, very hard to scale. And we could con continue around other problems as well. There were just too many to list about bottlenecks and, and, and problems that I've kind of encountered from that side of the table. Well, okay, we've got problems. Fine. Let's, let's keep thinking about it. So, on the other side of the table then, is, is, um, uh, is the simple fact 
that times are changing, right? Um, you know, progress has moved on to relational databases were figured out in the 70s, and you know, to more or less, uh, you know, JavaScript in there or not, the, the um, logic of it has remained quite constant. So, you know, um, uh, but the problem, of course, is, is these were designed for 1970s use cases, but this is 2050s, 15 now, so uh, we should know better. And also, I really wish Star Wars 7 isn't bad, and I really wish he's here. Uh, but uh, let's see. Um, well, first of all, you know, we could do the regular big data uh, arguments, which is the, the, you know, as many V's as you can put in a row, and as many, many um, uh, uh, acronyms as you can decide for the V's. So, for example, the volume of data has gone, grown much bigger uh, from the 70s to this day. The velocity of the data, the, uh, the way it's being fed into the systems, has uh, increased. So now we get more information from more uh, endpoints than ever. You know, even my watch writes log files, which is really surprising and fun to read uh, if you do that. Um, so you know, we get much, much more data out of uh, out of much, much more sources. That creates more data in, in on itself. Then of course the data is varied. You know, um, you know, some of it is business data, some of it is just log data, some of it is noise. Um, you have to pick out things uh, from it. Veracity meaning the accuracy of the data, meaning uh, well, you know, does it reflect what it means to reflect? Sometimes, for example, you know, one of the big problems of ETL is is you know if you've got crap data in the beginning, it will look completely weird in the end because uh, you again assume schemas. Um, then, of course, the question is value of the data has increased, you know, we've realized that uh, some data is more valuable than others and we can make, for example, machine learning predictions based on the value of the data. And then finally, you know, there's, since there's so much data, we have to also think about the visibility of it. So, we come to today then, from, from the 70s and from the SQL databases and the relational databases of old. Today, you know, I see these three languages as the uh, kind of top tier languages in modern analytics. So, you know, Python has great ground, Every, uh, there's great frameworks for Python doing analytics, like for example NumPy and SciPy. Um, Java, of course, with MapReduce being written in Java and Java being, you know, uh, very, very popular. I think it was uh, number three in the uh, Stack Overflow question uh, charts. So Java, of course, has, has a big staple hold. And more recently, R, the statistical language, has kind of made its uh, entrance from classrooms into, or you know, postgrad research rooms into actual enterprises. And, and a lot of people do write algorithms in R. And of course, you know, uh, Hadoop makes things easy because, you know, if you if you don't know how Hadoop works, it's got uh, you know a distributed file system where you just put files, and then something, you know, very simplified. Of course, there's many different things and layers uh, in, in the center here, but uh, the way it works is, is MapReduce 2 is, is basically a computing algorithm that will read the files and then, you know, output whatever. You, you can implement those map and reduce functions yourself with Java, or, you know, you can use a number of different interfaces that abstract the, the map and reduce function for you, so you can, you can just uh, mine that information uh, from the get-go. Um, but then another key element that has made life easier from an operational point of view. So not only do we have more variety, for example, expressiveness of how you want to interrogate your data um, compared to the 70s. Now we also have something called the cloud, um, which allows us to create bigger and better clusters for less and less money. So um, instead of, instead of you know, spending months and, and years on a project of planning a new analytics or data warehouse cluster, we can just simply write a JSON, put it into Amazon, and Amazon will spin me up exactly the kind of a cluster that I want. And more, uh, better than not, I only pay for what I use instead of you know, shedding $10,000 or euros in hardware costs to get something in place, to then start mining, and then you know, move on. So the cloud as a phenomenon has not only supported uh, DevOps in, into, into existence and happening, uh, it has made analytics significantly more cheaper uh, on the fly. For example, we saw that really nice hosted data, uh, database system um, in, in the earlier presentation today. I, I really like that. And I think that's the general uh, direction that most things are moving today. Okay, and this is just mapping, mapping, you know, what you could see from an Amazon context. But um, uh, this allows us to create new and better um, 
better um, uh, systems like data lakes, which is a new kind of architecture that makes life a lot easier. So for example, instead of having uh, this kind of three-tiered system where you have silos, now you just have a big database without any schema, you just dump your stuff there. Um, and an analyst can take, go in and take uh, ad hoc analysis on those uh, databases. And, um, and um, uh, based on that then, uh, you know, they can, if, when they do ad hoc analysis and they kind of interrogate the data, can just look at it, they can then come up with uh, structured models for, uh, for further analysis. Um, and then of course, uh, kind of extracting more, we can then move on into even more uh, complicated architectures like, for example, the Lambda architecture, which combines uh, something called stream processing, or you know, high-speed databases with slower speed, larger volume databases. And the idea about lam the Lambda architecture is, first of all, you've got some inputs. These could be your silos or your endpoints or whatever. Um, and they go through a stream that just contains, you know, um, very little amount of data, just a few days worth of data. Um, um, that could be a high-speed database or it could be something like Kafka, doesn't matter. And then you have a bigger sink, uh, like, you know, a massive uh, Hadoop cluster or a big enterprise warehouse um, that you store your historical data. And based on these two sources, you can make queries that reflect, you know, the now and the, and the future, or, you know, what's happening immediately and what was happening in the longer term. And that can be even further abstracted uh, to things like, uh, for example, the unified log processing system. So this slide I, I uh, got from uh, Snowplow Analytics from a presentation they did, and kudos to them, um, uh, which is a London-based company that does uh, data enrichment systems, which is, is really cool. But what, they, what they've kind of said is that um, uh, nowadays more modern data architectures will look like this so you've got some uh, you've got some narrow data silos, and you know it, as events happen, they get fed into this uh, uh, read-only log. And from here, you can you can read you know whatever you need to read uh, from from get-go, like ad hoc analytics and, and product recommendations and things like this. But um, and, um, you then archive most of the stuff into into a high latency data store for further interrogation and for these dashboard types of operations. Okay. So keep on thinking. This is me uh, in my house with a cup of coffee, uh, thinking more about this problem. Okay, well, you know, times have changed. Uh, Python has become more, you know, Python and Java and all these programming languages has become more available. And on the other hand, the cloud has really made cool systems like this uh, available and cheap. It still feels like big data is, is um, just the realm of uh, or you know, analytics done properly, or you know, really fast analytics is only the realm of these big American companies. Everybody likes to call unicorns. You know, those one billion plus valuation companies that can only do right things. You know, even the poop cut that comes out is uh, magical unicorn stuff. You know, and no one can get uh, uh, get enough of that, right? But uh, and the final kind of grander. Uh, thing that's had happened in the world over the last 10 years is something Mark Anderson said in 2011. Software is eating the world, you know, since software now has gone everywhere, um, pe more people have had to kind of learn how to deal with software. So we've had to come up with an idea called DevOps, or whatever, SecOps, Security Ops, that has made uh, development and operations kind of collide better amongst themselves. And the truth is, more and more develop, more and more uh, professionals have become software developers, whether or not they want to. So, for example, in most industries, software and data have become the only differentiating factor. For example, uh, cars nowadays. You know, if you look at what differentiates the cars, it's often the infotainment systems or the nice little launch control systems that rely on both data and software. And if, if Python and Java have become, and R have become the interfaces to analyze that data, that means we uh, analysts have also moved more towards software professionals. And, and on, from another point of view, mm -hmm. uh, DevOps and Agile and Lean teaches that uh, if value is dependent on speed and quality of analysis, then the only option is really to go faster. So to be ahead of our competition, we have to just be able to go faster. And then finally, the only way to be faster is to just, you know, within the realms of human limits, the only way we can go is to automate. And yeah, this just illustrates 
complexities of, of, pro, of uh, software in general and the fact that there's a there's kind of a big supply chain so not only not only on um, do things happen uh, uh, you know at the pace of um, yeah so okay so this um, uh, this uh, slide here, not yet, sorry, you're going to have to listen to me a little bit further. But this slide here illustrates that what, what, how can we then bring this phenomena, this phenomena of DevOps, into data and you know, create this magic speed of development. Um, and the truth is, I believe that we should not be talking about DevOps, or we should because it's a really good, really good phenomena in general, but we should also be talking about department ops, data ops, security ops. DevSecOps, DevDataOps, whatever, and um, that finally got me got me happy and thinking. Wait a minute, there is something here. So what DataOps? What can analysts and developers do together to bring about a better understanding? Because if we really think about it, their skills have moved in together. It's no longer that the data guy is a guy under the bridge. It's a guy with complementary skills to all of these things because they have to mine all of these these things. And, you know, the sweet spot really does sit in the center. You know, we have overlap in all of those things. Well, if, more, if uh, analysts have become more like software developers, then there's luckily many decades of learning in software development. And to be really effective at something is not only knowing what the right thing to do is, it's also, um, also um, uh, knowing when to do it. So, how can we as software professionals help our analyst brethren? Well, first of all, uh, one of the things I've really observed is oftentimes with, um, with, uh, on the analysis side of things, there is some kind of lack of expertise uh, in, in development. And that's just because, you know, they traditionally have not learned these skill sets or do, do work in these skill sets day to day. On the other hand, it's not a bad thing because, you know, you can't know what you can't know and you can only know so much. But the good thing is, the devs, in this case, are, are the friends of analysts, because devs deal with this stuff all the time. And this is seriously the pattern that I saw with most of my different companies and analysts when they were, for example, trying to extract data from a database, an if-else loop, uh, or even worse, even worse, a for loop that extracts a thousand rows at a time over a JDBC connection. That will take a lot of time. So, first of all, basics. Version control is your friend. It really is. Helps sharing it, changes, helps make transformations a lot better. And also, not sharing SQL over email is a really good first step. Uh, second of all, yeah, you can use dependencies. Um, like, so, for example, building a Hadoop project you can do in five minutes now because you can use those developer tools. And finally, peer reviews. Really good. Uh, you know, this <coughs> Spock is asking that Spock. Um, Yes. Another thing that we can learn from development, testing. You know, developers do a lot of testing because, because when we look at the systems and the information, uh, you know, there's uh, testing in software all the way from function levels to integrations and systems and uh, those levels. You can do these same things, for example, in, uh, in uh, Hadoop, for example, for MapReduce functions directly or for, for example, Hive Runners. And since, you know, we are dealing with terabytes of data, it might not make sense to might not make sense to um, run a script directly on your database because you know it might take half an hour to get that data back. If you're using newer systems like Sp like Spark or whatever, it might be slower. But oftentimes, it also makes sense to test your functions uh, and your uh, variables and your defined functions instead of um, you know figuring things out for yourself and then running with the database and then come back. Uh, uh, you know, on Monday and realizing that it didn't run, which I do uh, confess that has happened to me many a time. Um, then, of course, uh, this is something that popped up on a Facebook list. We have something like software-defined uh, uh, networks and software-defined uh, computing. So, because now we have this cloud thing and we can start defining uh, clusters themselves, what we can start doing is not using the same tool for, the, for every single job. Traditionally, data warehouses have been kind of designed as a man-in-the-middle type of uh, 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 operation where one cluster only works to support you know, multiple of use cases. Whereas, in, uh, whereas in if we start taking in this cloud thing and this uh, defined thing, we can actually spawn a cluster on demand for the type of operation that we need and then kill it once we're done. 
And that gets us, that little capability gets us to the cool thing about continuous integration. So what we can then start doing is, is taking those on-demand clusters and spawning them when we need them, only paying for them when we need them, uh, doing the types of jobs that we need, uh, and then killing it off. <coughs> this is an example architecture using AWS data pipeline. But um, uh, you know, normally, uh, you know, in development, you'd use something like Jenkins or whatever to um, actually do this thing. I'm not gonna explain this to you because I realize you guys probably understand. But what it means is, is you can actually use this, uh, these kinds of CI servers to do very many of the same operations that were normally reserved for those kind of cryptic ETL tools. For example, Jenkins can schedule those uh, uh, queries that you'd normally just you know, run magically in a box. Jenkins can run your tests uh, or CI servers, whatever they may be, can also do the statuses of your queries. So you could do like dashboards and see, you know, oh, my tests didn't pass, my, my new Hive model just doesn't work well enough. And then finally, you know, just to superimpose it on, a, on something like a Lambda architecture, um, uh, what you could then start doing is validate inputs, uh, you know, with them and schedule all of these clusters, you know, to be on and off. So, I guess we've reached the end now. Um, so this, the conclusions that we must then draw is, is I feel that analysis can take a lot from development nowadays and it has moved more and closer towards uh, software development than ever before in, in the history of these professions. Um, and that change is really for the better because it changes the role of the, of the uh, analyst from that guy at the bridge knowing at the bones to someone who contributes to that, you know, what a process that happens anyway uh, that is complementary to theirs. And um, we can use the best practices in these areas to make the life of your you know, database admin and all of these people better. Um, and finally, uh, I do believe that uh, in the future something like ETL and DBA activities will move more towards like what Q&A and testing has become now. Uh, contributors, toolsmiths to the greater process and more into a complementary focus uh, in, in these types of things. And finally, you know, just sometimes talking and having that little knowledge exchange with your peers helps. So, um, by bringing these professions together, you know, we can be more effective as an organization. And that leads us to uh, the speed of development. And once we have these lessons kind of in the back of our heads, even if some of them, that will help us uh, deliver insights and analytics faster than ever before. And it's really just the basic stuff. It doesn't take much. Oh well, that's it. Thanks very much everyone.